Well, hi, everyone. Uh, and uh, thanks to the organizers for, uh, for really an excellent uh, workshop. And uh, I'll just give a shout out to, uh, to Peter Bartlett as well, because uh, you know, he's successfully taken over the mantle from Alistair. And uh, just the work he's been doing is a tremendous service uh, to, to the community. So it's, uh, yeah, it's awesome to see that uh, all, all, the, all the programs still going on. So uh, as we're all uh, experts in, uh, in reinforcement learning, uh, I'm going to uh, you know, assume standard background knowledge uh, and uh, standard notation. And the talk is largely gonna focus on uh, both some basic issues, but given our audience also touch upon some subtle points as to what we might be missing and things that could potentially help us move forward. Uh, so we're gonna be looking at this space of policy optimization, which uh, we know is effective in many uh, different tasks. And some of the questions we wanna get at is uh, both what's going on and how to improve them. So these are issues with regards to like, look, these methods are great for dealing with large state and action spaces because of how you can plug uh, these neural networks into them, but we'd like to understand uh, what's the right way to think about uh, the, uh, these neural networks uh, with regards to their approximation power in these methods. Uh, the, you know, these methods are uh, very easy to compute gradients, but we like to get a handle on uh, convergence. And uh, finally, we also wanna think about how uh, they, the interplay between these methods and exploration. Okay, and just so we're on the same page, uh, let's uh, go through this example from, actually from Sebastian Thrun's thesis, I believe. Uh, this is a little toy example where you have like, you know, agent starts at S0, the rewards all the way at the right uh, uh, at S states away. And uh, if you act randomly starting at S0, uh, you know, it's a random walk with a drift with two thirds chance going backward, one third chance uh, moving to the right. So if you act randomly starting it, uh, you aren't gonna get to the reward with, uh, you know, it's exponentially slow probability. And what that translates to in terms of an optimization problem is, you know, your gradients are flat and not like the type of nice supervised learning flat gradients where you shake the system a little and you escape the Miyasada point. These gradients are flat to very high orders. So, so the, the gradients are, are flat to order uh, like S over two, like the length of the chain almost. Uh, so uh, so you, you shouldn't expect like a gradient descent method to solve this problem if you just started S0 and, uh, and you know, even just shake the system a little. Uh, and you know, how do we fix this? Well, ultimately, we'd like to solve the exploration problem. Uh, for this talk, we're largely going to cheat with a, with a practical cheat, which is we often assume some measure over the state space that has coverage. And we'd like to understand what's going on uh, in, terms of this, uh, in terms of this coverage parameter. And uh, this is an idea that uh, you know, it, it's, uh, people have thought about this a fair bit with regards to how we can use this measure to make the problem easier by relating uh, some notion of a supervised learning error to, uh, to policy improvement. Okay, so, you know, things we're going to think about is what's this role of mu with policy optimization, uh, you know, how to think about neural networks, and uh, revisiting some questions, uh, I'll, we'll think about like what we might be missing, and I'm just going to pepper in like a few conjectures here and there uh, as well. Okay, so, uh, basically, we're going to look at uh, both, uh, you know, optimization uh, ideas and generalization ideas. Uh, we'll start with uh, the, the tabular case where we're just going to literally look at uh, the, the problem where the number of states, number of states and actions are small. Uh, but even here, it actually helps to start, okay, there's a typo there. I'm going to start with like the vanilla policy gradients and look at regularization and the natural gradients. Uh, but even there, we'll start understanding what might be going wrong with regards to uh, exploration and how to think about the landscape. Uh, then we'll jump into uh, linear policies, a warm up, but then really trying to get into neural policies and try to get at understanding what the approximation power of uh, these methods are. And uh, and you know, mention a few comments after. And if you, uh, those of you who are around for like the little break. Uh, I think Mark and I had a little impromptu discussion. And one of the, the questions he was asking is, how do we think about what the projection step looks like when we're using uh, various neural notions of approximation? And I'll actually be getting into what that means with regards to uh, policy gradient methods. 
case, so jump in, uh, jumping in with the small state space case, uh, we're really gonna focus on the softmax policy class because uh, it's really just you know, one of the most basic ways to parameterize the space of all stationary policies. Uh, you're basically gonna get policies that look like this if you just take a vanilla gradient step uh, and do some kind of proximal projection back onto the simplex uh, with the KL, you're gonna also get kind of policies that, uh, that look like this. Okay, and, and the question here is, you know, do we have a uh, global convergence? The problem, is, you know, you can easily come up with examples showing it's non-convex. And what are the things that govern uh, the convergence rates? Okay, so the first uh, claim is if you just do straight up uh, vanilla uh, gradient descent over this policy class, uh, and you have the condition that this measure, so now we're not going to optimize just from S0, we're gonna have a starting state distribution that has uh, support everywhere, uh, then you will asymptotically get convergence. Okay, uh, and you know, it isn't convex, but in the limit you'll get uh, convergence. Okay, so a couple uh, you know, uh, uh, conjectures here. So the proof here is, uh, it's definitely like, it's super technical and it's just asymptotic. It's basically like a lot of analysis. Uh, and recently, uh, May uh, and, and Chaba here and a few others uh, showed that the asymptotic convergence rate uh, here is one over T after uh, T iterations. And uh, just a couple of conjectures, uh, again, like I don't, uh, very, you know, very, varying strength of my belief in these conjectures, but uh, this uh, assumption that this measure is full support, I think is pretty important that if you don't have it, uh, at least for a fixed learning rate, I actually believe you will not converge. Uh, even though your policy is stochastic, so there is a chance you're gonna wander around everywhere, uh, I actually do not think you will converge uh, uh, with this class, uh, even asymptotically. Uh, it's a conjecture. Uh, I also think that the, uh, the rate, the finite time rate in this method uh, could be arbitrarily uh, bad in terms of either the state space or the horizon. Uh, and what's going on is that even though you, if you have nice coverage over your state space, it seems like you're solving the, uh, the exploration problem, but you're getting killed due to your action exploration because of the softmax kind of collapsing your actions to become deterministic. I think Emma mentioned this point as well, that like there's reason to believe in other settings we're kind of botching the, uh, the action uh, exploration. And I think this is actually pretty uh, generic in, in other settings. I'll come back to this point later, but, uh, you know, th this thing, we're definitely botching the action exploration. Uh, so one thing to try is, uh, in addition to giving us a uh, kind of coverage with a start state measure, let's also add in a regularizer to try to keep the actions as being, uh, for, for being diverse. So here, uh, we're going to use the KL distance to the uniform distribution. So it's a bit different from the entropy regularization. Uh, and what's interesting here is uh, you can actually get a fully polynomial rate of convergence in terms of the number of states S, the number of actions, the target accuracy, and the horizon. Uh, provided again, mu has like uh, say uniform, uh, and if it's not uniform, you can write it in terms of the usual uh, kind of uh, density ratios. And, and the proof here is actually uh, pretty concise and revealing, uh, unlike this like asymptotic uh, proof. So uh, again, an, a, another uh, point here is, I'll come back to this later uh, with, with some comments, but in practice, people often use entropy rather than KL. And uh, entropy is actually, um, uh, it really, if you look at the shape of the entropy function, it's just not such a strong penalty to force uh, action exploration. And uh, again, Chaba in that same paper, they show if you use entropy instead, you will get, uh, uh, asymptotic uh, convergence at a rate of one over T or better depending on how, if you keep lambda fixed or, or de decaying it. Uh, now I do have a conjecture that uh, with regards to the dependence on the states and actions, uh, uh, so with, with regards to the size of the state space or the horizon, uh, even if your starting distribution was like uniform, so you don't have this exploration problem, uh, entropy uh, regularization, uh, I'm not convinced is strong enough to give you uh, a rate that's sort of poly in the number of states. Like, I think there's some pretty bad collapsing. I'll come back to this with things we're missing. Uh, and I'm not like necessarily advocating for KL uh, either, but at least 
we should get things right. We should understand what's happening in the tabular case, because uh, I think this is important because if we aren't even getting things right there, um, you know, we're botching something more, gen uh, um, more generally. So I'll, I'll come back to uh, some of the insights here that, uh, you know, care at least you can get a rate. I'm not necessarily pushing that this is the, uh, the greatest way to regularize uh, either to, to enforce this. Okay, but uh, again, there's another conjecture that I don't think entropy is gonna cut it for getting a poly uh, S coefficients. Okay, so now let's go to uh, tabular method uh, three, which is, uh, you know, the problem is coming in is we're trying to uh, move around on this uh, constrained simplex. And, uh, you know, what we uh, often do is try to warp the distance metric to stretch the corners out so we move more. And, uh, you know, there's a bunch of variants of this now, but uh, there's, uh, you know, this is what this natural gradient is doing, and there's a bunch of other uh, variants where you can look at this as a certain type of proximal uh, update as well, but you're just, um, you know, moving in the, the gradient direction with a preconditioner given by this Fisher metric uh, under a particular weighting, which stretches the corners out. Uh, for the tabular case, uh, actually for even more general cases, uh, this actually has this uh, nice uh, softmax policy uh, iteration update form. Uh, and, you know, to some extent, this is why we refer to these analysis methods, NPG, because of uh, this connection uh, for a while back of understanding how you can view this as a soft policy uh, iteration update rule. So for the tabular case, uh, this is a completely equivalent update rule if you look at how your policy changes. Okay, so, uh, so again, let's look at our tabular uh, convergence rate and, uh, uh, and then wrap up our tabular story. Uh, so what's interesting here is that, uh, uh, again, all of the tabular stuff was we're assuming exact gradients and we're looking at this like Oracle model of someone gives us exact gradients and we're looking at iteration complexity to getting like an epsilon optimal solution. And again, this is a non-convex update rule. Uh, what's pretty neat here is that uh, there's a relatively clean analysis that shows that, uh, you know, the rate is one over T with, uh, where the iteration complexity has no dependence on the number of states or actions. Uh, and it's a fast rate, which, you know, from the optimization side, uh, that's, uh, that's pretty neat. Uh, the analysis, as like Nevin mentioned, it actually really just goes back to this, um, uh, to a particular online analysis of uh, thinking about expert algorithms. But uh, somehow, even though it's non-convex, uh, it's a pretty uh, clean analysis to see that this update rule uh, actually quite quickly converges to the right answer uh, with iteration complexities that don't depend on uh, the number of states or actions. And what's interesting here, you don't even need like uh, full support uh, for, the, uh, you know, for the states or the action distributions. Uh, but again, this is all coming down to the fact that we're assuming uh, exact gradients. But even that is interesting because these other methods, uh, you actually do need stronger conditions to get uh, them to converge at, uh, at all, uh, let alone getting, uh, getting the rates to be uh, correct. So, so now we're, we get a sense of uh, what's governing our uh, convergence rates and how you know, certain issues are coming up. And we really want to see the interplay between that and uh, what happens when we use approximate gradients uh, and sample gradients to deal with large uh, state spaces, because now we're going to have function classes. Uh, and you know what's going on, uh, and you know in this newer case, like what's the right way to think about the um, the the kind of quote unquote projection step that's going to go on if we use a neural policy class. Okay. So uh, let's keep on with our uh, you know variants of softmax. Uh, parameterizations. So we're going to generalize it to say the chance of taking action A and S is now, uh, you know, the log of that is uh, proportional to some energy function where F is like uh, telling us the, the energy of taking action A. Uh, this clearly contains the, the softmax class if we just use this, uh, you know, this tabular parameterization. Uh, the log linear policy class, so this is a nice warm up case uh, before we go to uh, richer policy classes where we say this energy function uh, is linear in some known 
uh, features. And then uh, finally, we'll look at uh, what happens when F theta is a, is a neural network. And you know, one of the, I'll come back to this again in just some comments. One of the ways that gradients are nice compared to like various other uh, kind of incremental methods is what I call them. Uh, is it keeps a compact policy class. Like at the end of the day, you're going to spit out one neural network, which is uh, what your policy is doing. And you know, going back to some of these older papers like CPI, PSVP, uh, I think Bruno basically is pointing out that like CPI is like boosting and like look, boosting in uh, in like vanilla supervised learning, it's a complete headache because you get this god awful mess of mixtures of classifiers. And we know like this thing works great. But just holding the sucker in memory is uh, is awful, and uh, I think a similar thing is going on here. Like neural networks give us a very compact way to keep around one policy, and how should we think about that in light of uh, say these um, uh, these prior works about uh, incremental methods where we don't have compact policy classes? Okay, so starting up with a warm up, uh, which is the linear policy uh, class. Uh, so what the NPG update or variant of, of this will look like, which I'll give a theorem for, uh, is uh, rather than uh, you know, doing an update which is e to the exact q, you'll have this projection step uh, where you project the q values uh, onto your function space uh, phi. Uh, and there's a sort of choice of the measure we want to do here. Uh, one subtle point is I'm going to use a measure which has support over the actions as well. I'll come back to that. Uh, okay, so, so, so uh, two points here. I'm doing a projection step with the Qs on the phi, and the distribution is almost on policy, but I'm gonna start it with a measure that has support not only over states, but over all the actions. And that bit over actions uh, uh, is gonna be important here. Okay, so th that's how we uh, define the, uh, the sort of fit W star. Uh, so W star is really a function of the current data. Okay, then the update rule, if it was exact, it would be, again, the soft policy update rule. Uh, and, and this is basically equivalent to, to the NPG. I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, you know, we're going to give a theorem for the sample-based variant of this, which is, uh, you know, rather than using the exact fit, you use an uh, on-policy fit. And, you know, this is a warm-up case because, uh, um, you know, linear... In practice, we often use richer policy classes. Uh, this variant is it's basically uh, like Politex. For the analysis we're going to do, there's a, a minor difference worth emphasizing. Um, uh, just a quick dumb question. Um, where does S0 and A0 appear in your expression for W star? Ah, great. Yes. Uh, uh, so This is on behalf of Nan. We were just starting to discuss on the Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, questions. yeah so, uh, so this on policy is really, uh, it, it's, it's uh, it's this expression. So, so the way you're going to get samples is you sample S0, A0 from you, then you execute your policy pi, you cut off at a random time and take the S and A you get to. Okay, so you could cut off at, at zero as well, but uh, your, your state action measure is on policy starting from S0, A0. Okay, and, and that gives you a little bit of action exploration. Uh, and that's kind of uh, important to stress here. Okay, so, so again, similar ideas are in uh, politics. I think uh, I'm emphasizing this and again. This is a warm-up, but uh, the emphasis on the starting action distribution is actually pretty uh, important here. Okay, so I'm going to jump in for a second to say uh, you've got about four minutes left. Okay, sounds good. Uh, so, uh, so, so the assumptions we'll make uh, for now. Let's just do realizability. So, assume Q is contained in the projection. I'll come back to how you can uh, relax that. Uh, we're still going to have error, uh, which is like just a supervised learning error. So this is, uh, there should be a subscript there, but this is on policy supervised learning error. So I'll fix that in a later version. Okay. And the nice thing about the uh, uh, having this uh, measure mu is now you, this condition number here, you can write completely path free. So this is a ratio between uh, the, the, the covariance matrix of any comparator policy or the optimal policy and your starting measure. Okay? And this is why you really need this action exploration to make sure you get feature coverage. Because without that, this thing could be arbitrarily bad. Okay? And if you have this, again, it's realizability, uh, I'm assuming. But I'm still assuming error in uh, on policy sampling error. Okay? Then you'll get uh, you know, convergence at a rate of now 1 over root t 
it depends on your horizon. And uh, you get uh, something that depends on your statistical error, or your statistical risk, uh, and an ampli amplification factor due to this a relative condition number, how well your features uh, cover up. But the interesting thing about this relative condition number, it has nothing to do with the path of your algorithm because of this choice of mu. Okay. And uh, um, you know, one point to make here is uh, this style uh, is actually kind of important because we like in special cases uh, our bonds to hold, like for linear MDPs. Uh, because in, in cases like that, you really do have realizability. And uh, some of these prior bonds, just the way we stated it, will not actually hold uh, for these special cases. Okay, so given the time constraints, uh, the change we're going to have when we go to neural policies is uh, you know, now the question is, what's like the way to think about the projection step when you have a neural policy? Okay, so what's going to happen is, so F theta is now a neural network. Uh, it's basically the same style of the guarantee we had before, except the feature function now is going to be a, a function of the current neural network we have. So the feature function is actually uh, the gradient of our neural network at theta minus its expected value. Okay. And uh, if you forget about this last term, uh, if f of theta was theta dot phi, the gradient of that is just phi. Right? So this is basically the same as what we had before. So somehow what's governing the way in which our neural classes are approximating things have to do with kind of the gradient of this function. And that's what we really need to have approximating the, uh, the target value function. And you might expect this to happen for like uh, rich neural networks. Uh, but again, that's just the fitting power of neural networks. Uh, but this is a pre precise way to think about uh, what the projection step that's going on is. So what, you know, so this is an exactly equivalent way to do the NPG update, which is uh, you literally do a projection of your advantage onto these uh, neural features, which the neural features are induced by a gradient. Okay, and then you do, uh, you can do the sample based version, the same uh, mu dependence. Uh, and this would be the one way to do a soft policy iteration update. But I want to point, point out this is exactly equivalent to this update rule. So suppose you were just doing uh, the natural gradient update rule, which is Fisher inverse grad uh, the gradient, where you literally plugged in this policy class that is equivalent to this update rule. Okay, so this really is uh, sort of a, this offline discussion we have of what this projection means for a neural policy class uh, when we're doing policy gradients. And it actually has an interesting connection to the value function based methods uh, where the projection step is fitting your advantages under these particular features. Uh, now you're going to get a similar guarantee uh, with uh, with the neural policy classing, there's some typos there, but given time constraints, uh, you, you can look at the paper. The one point I want to mention is uh, the reason that uh, the important distinction here for the neural policy class and why this is working is you need your policy class to be smooth because if your policy changes very, uh, if, if your neural network changes very, very quickly as you changes your parameters, then it's going to be very unstable. So it governs things like in addition to the linear class, we need an additional assumption, which is uh, something about a policy class being smoothness, uh, a smoothness assumption. Okay. And uh, let me just come back to that point for uh, takeaways and wrap up. Okay, so uh, I'll just go with it. Like, like in practice, we're completely botching the uh, action, exp uh, action exploration. I think Emma was more polite about this, but I think in real settings, uh, we you know, look at Montezuma's revenge and things like that, we're actually collapsing our action exploration uh, quite badly. And my take for theory to practice is uh, entropy, you know, looking at the theory, I, I do not think it's aggressive enough. And, and this is clear from experiments. And I'm not pushing KL. For theory, KL is great, but I think KL is a little too uh, aggressive. Uh, I think something more reasonable is to explicitly not just think about coverage with your starting measure uh, just over states, but you want your starting measure to have coverage over actions as well. Uh, that gets into variance issues, but uh, again, like it, uh, on some cases, I think this definitely is more sane to do than trying to do this with regularization. 
Okay, so uh, see the paper for relaxing uh, the realizability assumption. I think one point I wanna make here is the way we should relax this realizability should still allow us to capture cases like linear MDPs. Uh, and that really means a more refined way to avoid these uh, uh, kind of density ratio coefficients. And like somehow the only way to do that is to break up approximation and estimation. Because if your class is realizable, uh, you, you really need a way to tease these, uh, th these two aspects apart. Because if you don't do that, the analysis does not capture basic things like linear MVPs. Uh, okay, and the last point I wanna make is, uh, you know, what's going on with regards to like these prior works with like various incremental methods? Uh, it's basically, if your policy class is smooth, like your ne network is smooth, uh, then you don't have to do these boosting styles of tricks where you have this huge ensemble of previous policies. Uh, by just making small gradient changes, uh, you will actually stay in the policy class you have uh, at hand and have guarantees that look basically like all the guarantees we've been proving for a while uh, with regards to uh, various concentrability coefficients. But the main point is, as long as our policy class is smooth, uh, we're getting compactness by staying in this class uh, and uh, with a similar style of guarantees and we know uh, now the right way to think about uh, the approximation condition, which is really just due to this paper by uh, Rich and Sutton, David McAllister and co on compatible uh, function approximation. So, um, you know, uh, again, thanks a bunch. So. Uh, this talk was really looking kind of at a um, kind of an optimization and generalization lens of what's going on with uh, a certain style of policy optimization. But I do think it's revealing because, you know, a lot of these ideas were around before, but I think just looking at the tabular cases, uh, you know, in our work and some subsequent work uh, that we're getting a sense of what are the issues at play, we see how those issues at play affect the, um, the function approximation setting. And you know, there's many open questions here, from like you know nuts and bolts issues to uh, you know much more general questions about how we do exploration uh, and handle model and the specification. So uh, thank thank you very much. Fantastic, thank you, Shem. This is a fantastic talk. Um, we are officially out of time, but since there are no more talks today, I think we can. Um, take some more time for questions. So uh, I do want to be mindful of people who might have to go, but otherwise. I'm sure there's plenty of questions. There was plenty of side channel chat. So uh, take it away, someone. Nani, you want to start? Yeah, so I, I want to comment or have a question on the linear MVP comment Sean left at the end. I think what Sean, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think your, your point is this, right? So when you measure distribution shift here, uh, you're measuring in a way that is takes into the consideration of the function class, right? So we're always measuring like these like uh, eigenvalues of covariance matrix of that, which is a very tight way of measuring. And I think the alternative that you're mentioning, the concentrability, is like just talking about like density ratios, right? Uh, but except, and, and density ratios are indeed like, you know, like stronger assumptions about data. But if you're talking about linear MDPs, density ratios work as well, right? Because in linear MDPs, all these distributions are convex combinations of the like the right factorization so, matrix. So, uh, so uh, density ratios, uh, so, so paying Alec uh, offline too, but the, the issue is, so these sort of bonds, they'll imply the previous concentrability bonds, not the yes. realizable ones, but the, the problem is uh, you could have atrocious uh, density ratios and the condition numbers can be like D, like your, the dimension. Uh, and this is real. Yeah. And, and I, I, this isn't like an, necessarily a problem with the algorithms, the incremental ones. It's an issue with the, uh, the analysis. See, see, the point now is what I'm trying to get at in uh, this sort of reinterpretation in the paper is there is the error due to uh, the statistical error uh, that's sort of uh, how much you're off. And that really is a conditioning effect, which is your features need coverage. And then there's a transfer learning error and transfer learning error uh, can be arbitrarily bad and we know we can pay density ratios and we just don't have a, a way to think about, uh, you know, when, when extrapolation occurs. So, you know, like Tang Yu is talking about that, uh, a bunch of people are talking about distribution shift. 
So, uh, so, so somehow the only way we can separate these two effects is to break this apart into two terms, which is the contribution from uh, the statistical error. And that contribution from the statistical error, we really do not pay a density ratio term. It's like, it's just strictly a better term. Uh, the density ratio is really coming from uh, the transfer learning and distribution shift. And you know, in practice, transfer learning uh, is much better uh, than we think it is. But the transfer learning factor for the incremental method is it's only transfer learning to the optimal learning, uh, the optimal policies measure. So, so that's why you know, it's sort of too subtle to get into to, to this talk. But it's very, what's very nice about not just PG, I think CPI, PSDP, the boost, any, any of these incremental methods is uh, Polytex is the notion of transfer is just to one distribution, not to all of them. So yeah, right. Uh, I, I see, I see, I see, I see. No, no, I get, I get so it. I think it's a subtle point, but uh, yeah, I just had this. No, no, I, I, yeah. You know, yeah, no, uh, no, no, I, 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 I and, and, and sort of the other thing I wanted to just add there is right. So density ratio, if you think about it, is trying to do a point-wise correction of expectation, right? Whereas really when you do the the covariance thing you're you're saying well first i'm going to take the expectation and then i'm going to fix the expectation which is a yeah. much milder way right no 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 i i i, I think there, there are two separate issues here so first of all i think i misunderstood uh shams point i think shams point is uh whether denominator no whether enumerator is d pi star versus like max overall d pi so and, you know, I mean, both, both are, yeah, that's right. That's right. Sorry. Yes. That's, that, right, that's right. one thing, but the, the, other, so I was ignoring that aspect, but I think you were talking about more of that. And there's a condition I, aspect, uh, as well. That, I, I was, I was more talking about the like expectation of B D transpose versus directly comparing densities. Yeah. Uh, I think yeah. these two things in linear and DPs are not that different. No, they're, they're very, they're very, different. They're very, they're very different. different. Wait, why? Uh, we can, we can, we can yeah, discuss again. Yeah, we, we can discuss uh, offline. Yeah. But the, the, the point is like, uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're really different because the, the other condition truly is a density ratio. And this, uh, you can always make a factor of D. So, uh, so let's come back to that. But I think, you know, uh, the talk is too short to get into those issues, but exactly. I think to make progress, this isn't necessarily just something about PG. It's just, you know, we just have to bite the bullet and write out two terms in the way we're doing the analysis. And people are starting to do that uh, more now. Um, so I'm sure there's other uh, comments, brick that's uh, questions. I see, Trevor, you had many comments you made during the presentation. Did you want to jump in and talk about these conjectures? Oh, it was just that one of the conjectures, conjecture number two, has been resolved, and the answer is like you're right, and the situation is even worse. Like depending on the initial condition, you can push these constants arbitrarily high, and you can reduce to show that. Yeah. Uh, now the the thing is, in practice, this is why I kind of made this action exploration that like while KL you can get the constants, you would never want to like KL. Uh, See what's going on because entropy, like even if your peak entropy is always bounded by like you know k log k, where k is your vocabulary size, right? Like uh, like the worst case for entropy, the largest it can be, and and it's and it's bounded below by zero, like it never explodes. Whereas KL against uniform, if you go into the boundaries, uh, you know you're saying zero when you should be saying constant, and it explodes. So KL will really keep you away from those corners. Uh, so for theory, this is great, and you can see that in the proof. It's like a couple of steps, but in practice, ugh, like I would not like. I think we might have tried it on Monozuma's Revenge, but like no, no, no. It it is too uh, aggressive. So uh, like entropy, like really does keep you exploring uh, a bit. Like in Monozuma's Revenge, it's like seventeen actions. Entropy keeps you like jumping around two of them, but uh, you're actually dropping actions that you really should be taking to uh, to explore. So uh, this issue of something more explicit on your action exploration, uh, like it really is needed. Uh, and you know, it's yeah. not too surprising because like where can you come from anyway, it's states. You should do it over states and actions. This is actually a good segue to maybe a follow up. You actually mentioned a little bit at the end about uh, the importance of exploration. And I'm just wondering about whether this optimization point of view is, is like 
we, we like this because it breaks the problem into two problems, but is, is, this, is this a good thing or is this not a good thing? I, I often wonder about this. So, um, right, so this is, uh, maybe I give my uh, take. This is kind of related to Gurgay's point, like should we calling this PG? Like, look, at the end of the day, I think a family of incremental methods uh, are gonna have similar styles of guarantees. And I think like Bruno has papers kind of uh, uh, comparing them. But I would say um, maybe the issue isn't breaking them into two parts. A, a more technical way I, I view this issue is uh, because at the end of the day, suppose we're doing something like PCBG or you know something more data efficient, which is uh, s some more explicit exploration. Uh, the way I view this is how do we reuse uh, data effectively and uh, be robust to uh, model misspecification. And PG, the way these guarantees works, is they, they're polynomially efficient sample-wise, but they're really not efficient sample-wise in, in, in practice. Uh, but the reason they're robust is if you're not doing backups based on previous data, you know, like you're trying to be as close to on policy as possible in PG. Okay, and that's mm -hmm. great for approximation guarantees, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, for data reuse, uh, this is like the example you have, like data reuse, you want to do backups, but if your backups are wrong, it kills you. And uh, even when you're incremental, like it just doesn't play well. So the way I would uh, say this, it just really starts coming down to how good are our representations to leverage the ability to, to reuse data. And the more we can do that, I think that, you know, both the more aggressive we can be, uh, and, uh, um, you know, the more effective we can be with our, you know, exploration. So, so that's sort of my, you know, last bullet point on mm. the comments slide. Isn't that a nice research problem, by the way, of kind of figuring out how much data reuse you can tolerate? Like, no, that, try not to decide upfront about like whether we're gonna try to stay on policy or we're going to use all the data. It's like, uh, maybe it should be adaptive in some way. I really yeah, don't know. Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, this is good. I'll give a, just a shameless plug to a paper. Uh, so I need to read your uh, linear Q star paper, Chaba. Like, uh, you know, I, if, if it's true, I owe you a beer. I've been thinking about that problem forever. Uh, so uh, I owe you a beer if I, if I believe it. So on your data uh, reuse point uh, and batch RLs, is it? This is uh, a result along that flare that uh, if you assume realizability, so if you're linear function class uh, and you have coverage over all the features, so and you just want to do policy evaluation. So the best you could hope for is co coverage. This isn't enough to do batch RL. You get an X B lower bound. Okay, and again, this is pointing to like what we're seeing in, in RL is we kind of need stronger conditions to do the things we want to do. Mm -hmm. so, so at least that's I, one of your, uh, can, can, and Nan has like many upper bounds on what the stronger conditions uh, are and, uh, and you know, they're kind of getting uh, close to each other. But uh, yeah, so, so this is kind of, uh, you know, I, I agree with your point, Shaba, and Nan's been, this is all Nan's been doing. Yeah, I, I just want to like, this is precisely the point I want to get at. Uh, I just chatted with that a little bit. So it seems like in the batch setting, I think this covariance matrix uh, covariance condition is very appealing, except that you guys showed all the lower bound that says that in the batch setting, this is just not that useful, right? And we need stronger conditions. And I, I think this is the paper that my recent paper is like, if you have pretty strong density ratio type of conditions, I can actually just get a realizability to work. Uh, I, I think it's pretty, yeah, you get these like weird trade-offs like, you can, you can have weaker data assumptions, but a very, very strong function approximation assumption or very strong data assumption, but now we know how to get rid of all everything else other than realizability. Uh, yeah, but so it's, 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 it's interesting it's, to see how we're going to proceed from here. Yeah, I mean, the other thing I did want to add there is, so sort of the main opportunity we have in this setting is, of course, that because we are running on policy algorithm, we can still be uh, more adaptive about how much history we're going to reuse so that we don't sort of uh, we are into the land of being too much off policy and um, at least like in theory. So, uh, so Andrea was doing some work with me this summer on, on these sorts of questions. And mm -hmm. he is finding that you can reuse 
uh, data from a lot of past trade rates uh, with pretty much even like important sampling type uh, corrections without blowing up the variance of estimates. And that does provide actually uh, um, a reasonable reduction in sample complexity. Um, so I, I think sort of my, my main uh, worry with a lot of uh, data reuse type questions, especially uh, when thinking about the uh, interaction between sort of data reuse and uh, modeling assumptions has been that, okay, you know, Maybe uh, maybe if I really assume something like a linear MDP, then I would feel very comfortable using Bellman backups and whatnot because everything is sort of nice and linear and all backups are gonna be closed and stable. Uh, but if I wanna be robust to misspecification, I don't wanna use them and you know, um, that but, really- but, th but this is the point that for our uh, example, uh, if you just wanna do policy evaluation, uh, you actually have your policy is linear in these features and you have coverage over all the features. So here your backups are actually truly unbiased and unbiased in every state gives you unbiased all the way through. So these lower bounds actually show exponential variance in your, uh, your estimate. Wait, so should, is is this paper on archive? No, no, it'll be like uh, almost done, uh, okay. almost done. Uh, but, it, but it's not a crazy construction in like two to the okay. eight states. It's like a very what small number. You, you guys seen Meng, Meng Di, uh had had a paper uh, just very recently. Uh, I think ICMA this year, but she was looking into this, and then she had matching lower upper bounds on. No, some... but but uh, Chaba, she has uh, inherent Bellman error assumptions. Yeah, that's the point, right? Uh, okay, you, you need a closeness on the Bellman update. I see, I see. So, so right, so somehow like this is kind of the spectrum of like what are we leaning on? Yeah. Uh, yeah. with regards to okay. just you know, evaluation, improvement, uh, and like exploration. And, and that's, uh, you know, why I don't have super high hopes for like unification because I, I think like how we handle these things, you know, my, it's more a philosophical point, but I think in some settings, like our models are right, like physics. And when your models are right, like physics, like you can predict black, black holes and they exist. And then other settings like biology and chemistry, you know, your models are kind of poor and you can lean on them a bit, but uh, it's a very different style of uh, ways we think about our world. And I, I think it's exactly the same issue uh, here that, uh, the, you know, the, the domains are really gonna govern how much we can lean on these different techniques. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think partly, you know, there's progress in understanding when they work. And I think Alex point again in our pre-chat that helps us in, you know, how aggressive we want to be like the type of things that Emma does, like in, you know, uh, educational things and like real science applications. Uh, you want to take a lot of care before you deploy things and you're using off policy stuff. Whereas if I'm doing, you know, physics sort of stuff, like whatever, it's all compute. I can try things quickly as long as I don't break my robot. So, um, I mean, that's more of my own um, personal take on, on that issue. On this note, uh, feel free to continue. I am going to step out and, and join the Gather Town, but this is a fantastic discussion. So please feel free to stick around. Thank you, Sham, again for the talk. Uh, yeah, thanks everyone uh, for, uh, yes, tomorrow. Thank you for organizing. Uh, all right, I might uh, want to.